I have an infected jaw at the moment, so uh, just to let you know if I slur, it's not because I'm drunk, alas, it's because I can't actually speak properly. Tonight I'm talking about um, a couple of Hardy's gothic short stories. Uh, you might not see him as having written gothic short stories, but he did indeed. And another apology is this is longer than my usual talks, so please bear with me and I hope you don't fall asleep. So, in a number of his short stories, Thomas Hardy adopted the themes and signifiers of Gothic in order to explore various social and psychosexual constructions of Victorian masculinity. Hardy is generally recognised as an excellent delineator of the female. His intuitive understanding of the psychological complexities of women such as Tess Durbeyfield and Sue Bridehead being emphasised at the expense of his male characters, who are often viewed as weak and two-dimensional. Needless to say, I don't agree with that. But what is less frequently recognised is that Hardy often also examines men in the light of their ambitions and sensitivities, hypocrisies and social expectations. Where novel writing provides the opportunity for extended use of narrative techniques, the short story form requires a specific incident or character trait to create an immediate and lasting effect within a constrained word limit. A tale, as opposed to a novel, is able to be read in a single sitting and can thus hold complete sway over the reader for the duration. The term tale itself also has roots in a specifically oral condition tradition, sorry, comprising folk tales, ballads, exemplars and fables, and lends itself to a form of storytelling in which sensational and melodramatic, horrific and terrifying can all be rendered with a degree of verisimilitude disguised as historical fact. The Gothic short story allows for specific incidents or character traits of a more extreme nature to be related, whilst still retaining reader credulity. When receiving a story in the mode of a folklore tale, instances of the marvellous are presented as actuality and accepted by the reader in kind. This is in contrast with the realist novel in which incidents such as the turning of the blood in the withered arm will jar assumptions of probability. The Gothic as a genre exploits readerly expectations of lurid actions perpetrated by grotesque characters as part of convoluted plots involving issues of primogeniture and inheritance usually. The Gothic short story as featured in Blackwoods and similar magazines is more dependent upon a unity of effect in which no word is superfluous. The author's intention being to elicit terror within a limited textual space, creating a balance between actuality and artifice that holds the reader enthralled. The effect is achieved through the power of brevity. A withered arm, a disfigured statue and a demonic fiddle player are used as vehicles by Hardy through which the incredible or fantastic highlight instances of toxic masculinity and grotesque extremes of human behaviour. While Hardy's fame and posthumous reputation generally rests on novels such as Far From the Madding Crowd, Tess and Jude, he in fact wrote 49 short stories. Oops, I'm doing it the wrong way. There we go. 49 short stories collected in four volumes. Wessex Tales, A Group of Noble Dames, Life's Little Ironies and A Changed Man and Other Tales. His novels often attract criticism for their convoluted plots, archaisms, coincidences, and randomly placed learned references, but his short stories are eminently readable. Hardy's short story writing was usually 
the result of a direct request from magazine editors and was undertaken for financial remuneration. Factors which led many readers, both Victorian and modern, to view these tales as mere potboilers. However, the act of writing short stories for publication called for a constant readjustment of Hardy's sense of the audience he was writing for, a chameleon-like adaptability to different sets of expectations and criteria of acceptability. In most cases, Hardy seems to have been willing to tailor his stories to the social character or particular readership of a periodical's audience. Short story writing was an onerous task. Hardy would have had to register the particular identities of the magazines he was writing for on both sides of the Atlantic and their target readerships. He sent letters to various periodical publishers stating his aim to use his best efforts to please your numerous readers maintaining a healthy tone suitable to intelligent youth of both sexes. This made rejections from periodicals such as the graphic for tales that a father may not feel comfortable reading in family circles, all the more perplexing. The stories originally published in the graphic as a cycle, A Group of Noble Dames, and which contained Barbara of the House of Greed, were particularly butchered in order to meet editorial demands. Following an interview at the offices of the graphic, Hardy wrote, here's a pretty job. Must smooth these directors somehow, I suppose. The demands in this particular case were no hint of pregnancy, childbirth, nor sexual relations, whether adulterous or sanctioned by marriage one or another of which offending incidents, of course, occurred in all tales. Much egregious bodlerization was carried out on Barbara in particular, but Hardy had intended from the start to reinstate the original material once he had earned his money in the marketplace. <coughs> Excuse me. Barbara in particular was singled out as a hideous, hateful fantasy. And it is worth mentioning here that what we now term as gothic tales were indeed originally referred to by publishers and readers as romances or fantasies. In his short stories, Hardy studied the perverseness of human nature in both romantic and sexual matters, often pursuing them to bitter and violent conclusions. Where the prevailing sexual double standards of the 19th century are exposed in a protracted denouement of two or three chapters in novels like Tess, in the tale A Withered Arm, the constraints of the short story format mean that the denouement takes place within the space of a few lines making Hardy's interrogation of masculine sexual mores all the more powerful for its immediacy. Similarly, the climax of The Fiddler of the Reels comprises only a handful of paragraphs containing a damning indictment of popularly received notions regarding maternal duties. Having his interrogations of sexual mores and the corresponding societal hypocrisies so heavily deleted while in magazine publications, such as was the fate of the short story cycle, A Group of Noble Dames, confirmed for Hardy that a disdain of periodical editors and readers, who Hardy divided into the grundiest and subscriber and the mature and penetrating reader, with the first category seemingly most prevalent. This may have led to his writing the essay Candor in English Fiction in 1890, in which Hardy stated that the order must either whip and scourge characters into doing something contrary to their natures to produce the spurious effect of their being in harmony with social forms and ordinances, 
or by leaving them alone to act as they will, he must bring down the thunders of respectability upon his head, not to say ruin his editor, his publisher and himself. Hardy's fiction is eclectic, containing elements of the realist, the tragic, the sensational, the pastoral, the gothic, the melodramatic and the didactic. Hardy did not believe that a fiction writer's role was simply to serve up a slice of mundane everyday life. Hence his utilization of unusual characters and plots and instances of wild improbability within his shorter narratives that in essence crystallize and intensify a particular idea, which would prove difficult to sustain throughout the length of a novel. In his autobiography published under his second wife's name, he stated that a story must be exceptional enough to justify its telling. Hardy's Gothic short stories are indeed exceptional in their brief and brutal depictions of toxic masculinity and psychological torture. Hardy's diffusion of gothic motifs and taste for macabre folk tales provides a fruitful platform from which to explore themes such as gender and social conventions through an alternative lens in confronting such sexual taboos. Through the gothic short story mode, Hardy is able to provide much more concentrated instances of the bizarre and improbable than he can in his novels. His striking and often unusual characters, such as his cunning folk and devilish musicians, leave an impression all the stronger for the brevity of their appearance. Hardy gleaned from the Gothic tradition certain devices conducive to spectacular terror. There are three elements within Hardy's shorter fiction which readily identify him with the Gothic. And they are the preternatural, the terrible and the grotesque, each of which permeate these dark tales. In The Withered Arm, Hardy represents an instance of esoteric masculinity in the person of conjurer Trendle, whose eccentricities are not derided, but revered due to his lack of ostentation and his refusal to take monetary payment for his services. This character is representative of the more fantastical elements within the story, but his benevolence serves to emphasize the contrasting malevolence of Farmer Lodge. Barbara of the House of Greed is arguably Hardy's most gothic short story, exploring the dark recesses of psychosexuality and how a sociopathic male causes a massive psychological schism in his wife. However, the true victim of this story is not the terrorized naive heroine, but the young Edmund Willows, a male casualty of society's obsession with aesthetic appearance. The Fiddler of the Reels, one of Hardy's most critically discussed short stories, articulates a male form of othering in which a man who is not provided with a single word of dialogue yet dominates the narrative exploits music and dance as forms of physical and mental torture. These three stories also represent examples of what I've already called toxic masculinity, male protagonists who glory in the manipulation and domination of their female counterparts as a traditional aspect of Victorian patriarchy, ultimately resulting in the fracturing of the female partner's psyches. The portrayal of Lord Upland Towers in Barbara of the House of Grebe is particularly disturbing in that psychological poisoning of his wife produces a literally lobotomizing effect upon Barbara, engendering a sense of revulsion in the reader, which is enhanced by the utilization of tropes such as imprisonment and disfigurement. 
in the fiddler of the reels a nurturing man is pitted against a male character whose physical beauty is almost feminine in its features but whose effect upon the female inhabitants of the village he resides near is universally ruinous However, it is Hardy's earlier story, The Withered Arm, which best embodies the gothic elements of the preternatural, the terrible and the grotesque. Here, a cunning man unwittingly causes the death of a beleaguered woman seeking a grotesque remedy for what she perceives as her failure to retain the affection of her toxic husband. The Withered Arm, submitted to Blackwoods magazine in January 88, contains example of the intersection between Victorian science and folklore, along with elements of the preternatural. Indeed, Gothic tropes of hanging and disfigurement serve to validate the folkloristic elements, such as oomancy and corpse curing, which we'll come to which would otherwise have been marginalised by both magazine editors and readers as being too fantastical. Though Longman's magazine rejected it as being too grim and unrelieved for a magazine read mostly by girls. Engaging with myth and the occult, most notably in the hag riding episode, this story incorporates symbolism and the esoteric in order to explore a liminal yet benevolent construction of masculinity alongside a more poisonous one. One of Hardy's most gripping stories it is a tale steeped in Wessex superstitions and legends, while also serving to castigate patriarchal conventions such as primogeniture. Farmer Lodge brings home a pretty new young wife called Gertrude, much to the consternation of Rhoda Brooke, a washed out milkmaid who we soon discover gave birth to Lodge's illegitimate son some years before. Rhoda has a dream in which she seems to be hag ridden by an older withered version of Gertrude who perches on her chest, almost suffocating her. In a panic, Rhoda lashes out, grabbing Gertrude's arm and flinging her to the floor. The next day, mysterious fingerprint marks appear on young Gertrude's left arm, and it slowly begins to wither. The majority of recent critical readings of the story have adopted Freudian or Jungian perspectives, focusing on the supposed sexual jealousy between Gertrude and Rhoda. But there are issues with approaching the story too symbolically like that. Hag riding or overlooking as it was also called is a form of witchcraft in which someone exerts an evil influence in order to do an injury to a person or animal and was a popular belief in Dorset folklore. One of the first of Hardy's Wessex topographers, Herman Lee wrote that the story begin, brings before us vividly one of the old time superstitions which are now fast dying out. The dream which came to Rhoda is an incident by no means uncommon and similar occurrences have been repeatedly brought before the reader of this guide, i.e. Herman Lee. By a certain class of people it would perhaps be referred to as a nightmare. Amongst the less literate, such a dreamer would describe herself as being hagrod. Doubtless the recorded instances would be much more common were it not that the sufferers are chary of mentioning their fears and the facts, save to those who will be more likely to show sympathy than scepticism. And that was in 1913. The nature of this particular instance of hag riding is more ambiguous than certain literary critical judgments suggest. In the dream, it is actually Gertrude astride Rhoda's chest, and thus she would appear to be the hag rider. And yet it is Gertrude who suffers the physical defect which follows. Indeed, neither woman wishes the other ill but by the conclusion of the tale, they have both been punished for the sins of a man, Farmer Lodge. 
Leslie Stephen, a mentor of Hardy's, advised the author to provide a scientific explanation for the urban readership of his supernatural story. Hardy rejected this advice, leaving the overlooking and withering unexplained, refusing to mitigate the sense of evil with a rational explanation and thus lending the tale a much more disturbing atmosphere. The naive Gertrude seeks nostrums and charms, mystic herbs, books of necromancy in order to find a cure for the withering, a disfigurement that has estranged her superficial husband, he having only courted her for her grace and beauty and the possibility of bearing a legitimate son. Rumours circulate amongst the small community of Homestoke that the loss of the use of Gertrude's arm was owing to her being overlooked by Rhoda Brook, though it was actually Rhoda who was ridden by the incubus. Thus Rhoda suffers the ignominy of falling twice by bearing an illegitimate son and by being alluded to as a witch. Rhoda is very interested in Gertrude's social standing shown by the older woman's preoccupation with the younger's hands, dress and manners, which serves to sharpen the differences between the two women and to underline their opposing physical, social and moral attributes. There are further dichotomies between the two women, such as their being respectively dark and fair, guiltily vengeful and innocently victimized but as stated the nature of the hag riding episode is ambiguous at the very least and it is far from clear either that Rhoda does feel vengeful towards Gertrude or that the distinction between the two women is as definitive as readers generally believe. Instead Hardy leaves deliberately open the question of who is cursed and who the cursor. Indeed, the two women are then brought together in a commonality of purpose as they approach Conjurer Trendle in order to achieve a resolution to the dilemma of the withering. Trendle is a solitary heathman, a white wizard, a cunning man and knowing man. He is one of various cunning folk who appear in Hardy's fiction, such as Elizabeth Enderfield from Under the Greenwood Tree and Wido from The Mayor of Casterbridge. Wessex cunning men range in abilities and functions from the gifted amateur to strict professionals, and they are mediators between supernatural powers and the ordinary man. Practitioners of divination, folk medicine and magic, they may not be openly approved of and countenanced by the denizens of the communities in which they reside, but they are abided and in some cases highly respected. Herman Lee wrote of passing at the spot which Hardy based Trend Trendle's cottage on, where he inquired of a rustic working nearby, remember this is in 1913, if he remembered the cottage when it was occupied, the gentleman replied in the affirmative, claiming that the occupant had been a seventh of a seventh. In other words, the seventh son of a seventh son, a strict essential for the holding of occult powers, apparently. The folklorist Ruth Firra notes that the apparatus and methods of these knowing men actually date from the polemic of the Greek Hippolytus, the same paraphernalia and techniques also appear in Reginald Scott's Discovery of Witchcraft, published in 1584. Far from being malevolent, Trendle is represented by Hardy as, a ben as benign, a man who practices magic for positive, curative ends. Not only does he not boast of his Kabbalistic knowledge and talents, he downplays them as if they are simply acts of chance. He has no interest in the personal business of the people who request his services and he refuses monetary payment. As opposed to the somewhat sociopathic and superficial Squire Lodge, who is obsessed with primogeniture and physical appearance, Trendle's masculinity is one of empathy. 
It is informed or perhaps defined by his personal practice of the German Einfluung. Einfluung, and please forgive me if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, translates from the German as feeling into a form of empathy that the German romantic thinker Navalis viewed as a corrective against contemporary scientific attitudes of dissecting nature into all its individual elements, such as Georges-Louis Leclerc's work on the mechanical properties of wood or Carl Linnaeus's biological classification systems. Einfeldt ignores all of this. Rather than promoting the many uses of wood and how its properties are of benefit to man, Einfühlung is an empathy with the wood itself, feeling into the originary tree as a like-minded creature. Not only do Hardy's literary notebooks mention Novalis in two specific entries, there is also a direct allusion to him in chapter 17 of The Mayor of Casterbridge. Character is fate, said Novalis. Trendle does not consider in what way each customer wishing to procure his services as a cunning man may be of use to him materially. Instead, he feels into these people, his empathy providing a natural corrective for what ails them spiritually. After performing the act of umancy, which is breaking egg whites into a tumbler of water so that one may divine the face of the person who has caused them harm, Trendle informs Gertrude that she has been blasted and her wound may only be cured by turning of the blood. She must touch with her withered arm the neck of a man who has just been hanged. Lee notes that in 1913, this was still considered an infallible cure by a number of the older Wessex folk for certain obscure diseases which defied medical diagnosis and treatment. This may help the reader to understand Hardy's refusal of Leslie Stevens' direction to provide a scientific explanation for the withering. Hardy is interested in the capacity of the tale as a form to draw upon its folkloric origins in order to suggest the possibility of a different relationship to nature and to other people than that provided by encroaching modernity. In The Withered Arm, discourses of science and folklore intersect, just as they do later in The Fiddler of the Reels, when Gertrude considers that turning blood or blood turning is capable of, no, is capable of a scientific no less than a ghastly interpretation. And galvanism is alluded to when Gertrude is about to faint just before laying her cursed limb upon the hanged man's neck. Galvanism is also alluded to in The Fiddler of the Reels, when simply the sound of Mop Olimore's footsteps passing outside the house is enough to make Caroline Aspent start from her chair as if she has suffered an electric shock. The denouement of the withered arm reveals that the unfortunate victim of the gallows is, you probably guessed, the illegitimate son of Rhoda and Farmer Lodge who both happened to witness the unwitting Gertrude's attempt at corpse curing as they come to collect the young man's body. In a rage, Rhoda once again grips Gertrude's arm and flings her away. Poor Gertrude dies of shock. Her blood had been turned indeed too far. Gertrude's preternaturally withered arm has led her to perform a desperate and grotesque act with terrible results. She has turned twice, just as Rhoda has fallen twice. Both women suffer for their interactions with a destructive form of masculinity in the character of Farmer Lodge, the true villain of one of Hardy's most powerful and most gruesome shorter narratives. For a number of literary theorists, Rhoda is the agent of a malignant power which serves to demonstrate the effects of guilt tissues which arise inevitably from the conditions of sexual rivalry, 
which determine the relations of women under the gaze of men. But while it may be true that the two women are initially positioned through Lodger's actions as rivals, his marriage to Gertrude closes down the possibility of him giving Rhoda or her son legitimacy. In fact, they go on to develop a very close friendship that continues even after Conjurer Trendle's act of umancy has clearly identified Rhoda as the person responsible for Gertrude's blasting. The malignant power in this story is actually therefore embodied in Farmer Lodge. For not only has he married Gertrude simply for her physical beauty and potential provision of a male heir, but the reader is also reminded of his callous abandonment of Rhoda and his refusal to publicly acknowledge their son. In the mode of the female Gothic, as practiced by Anne Radcliffe towards the end of the previous century, Hardy deploys Lodge as a vehicle for exploring female persecution, a manipulative male entrapping the heroine within the prison chamber, in this case, of her disfigured arm. Her deformity having no perceivable tangible cause, Gertrude is entrapped by Lodge within a space of psychological torture based upon her supposed failed femininity, the ugliness of her withered arm prohibiting any physical allure and thus constituting a bar to the sexual congress which would have resulted in an heir and the familiar fulfillment, sorry, of her conjugal duties. Hardy reportedly commented to S.M. Ellis after the tale had been published that a story dealing with the supernatural should never be explained away in the unfortunate manner of Mrs. Radcliffe, referring to Anne Radcliffe's Gothic novels of the previous century. Here, Hardy is acknowledging not only the Gothic as a literary genre, but what he deemed to be one of its faults. Hardy wrote to William Blackwood, who published the story, that though it was weird tale, the cardinal incidents are true, both the women who figure in the story having been known to me and viewed as dull and imaginative, Leslie Stevens' later criticism of there being no scientific explanation provided by Hardy for the withering. The withering may in fact be read as a physical manifestation of Squire Lodge's tyranny over the female body, a destructive masculinity instrumental in Gertrude's physical and mental decline, resulting in her premature aging and loss of beauty, her withering. Hardy's lack of a scientific basis for the phenomenon allows such interpretations. It is a projection of Lodge's toxicity and superficiality, resulting in one woman dying twice and the other falling twice. Rhoda is punished and ostracised for bearing an illegitimate child. Gertrude is tormented by her loss of beauty and subsequent inability to produce the desired heir. In The Withered Arm, Hardy presents two contrasting models of masculinity, the benevolent and empathetic Trendle, who provides the women with an alternative route to knowledge and understanding, and the manner, malevolent sorry, Lodge, whose self-obsession destroys them. In Barbara of the House of Grebe, toxic masculinity becomes concentrated into a portrayal of sociopathy, the male project to marginalise or destroy the female mind and will. In this tale, a husband enjoys mentally torturing his wife to such an extent that she suffers a psychotic breakdown, leaving her ultimately in a similar predicament to her predecessors, Rhoda and Gertrude, unable to successfully perpetuate a patrilineal line. Barbara of the House of Grebe is a lurid tale. Gothic in its composition, it contains elements both gruesome and cruel, and as Susan Hill notes in her introduction to the Penguin Classics edition, it is quite different in its heartlessness and coldness, as well as its Gothic style, from anything else Hardy wrote. 
The literary critic James Scott suggested that it is the furthest foray into the Gothic in Hardy's corpus, in which he assembles nearly all the standard equipment of Gothic grotesquerie, mental imbalance, sexual abnormality, mutilation and disfiguration, sadistic brutality. When a group of noble dames of which Barbara is a part, oops, sorry, I've gone too far there, of which Barbara is a part, was published in volume form, it created much dissent amongst reviewers, some of whom had previously been supportive of Hardy's work. The spectator found a nauseous element pervading every story, while the Saturday Review wrote off the collection as a literary freak. The Pall Mall Gazette attacked the volume as an abuse of the slackening of external constraint concerning sexual matters. Critics were scandalised by the reintroduction into volume form of all the previously bodlerized elements from the periodical publication of the stories. These elements included no mention or hint of pregnancy, childbirth, sexual relations, whether adulterous or sanctioned by marriage, which of course appear in all of them, as we saw. The original manuscripts show that Hardy cancelled certain passages in blue pencil, which were then subsequently marked for inclusion in volume form. Such incidents, of course, occur many times throughout Hardy's fictional oeuvre, but one scene contained within Barbara was considered particularly disturbing. Upland Tower's mental torture of his wife as her cure for a psychological infidelity. The first thing to be excised from Barbara by the editors of the graphic was much of the horror that Barbara felt at the revelation of Edmund's face on his return from Italy. Barbara's terror, Edmund's demand that she look a second time, her shudder at the sight, they're all omitted from the periodical. Without experiencing Barbara's extreme distress at the frightening aspect of this first husband, it becomes very difficult for the reader to accept the complete transformation in her attitude to her second husband after his treatment. This treatment or cure is the most gothic element of the whole story. Lord Upland Towers is Barbara's second husband after her elopement with the young handsome Edmund Willows ends tragically with the latter's death. Edmund had been badly injured during his continental education while risking life and limb rescuing Italian theatre goers from a fire. When he returns to England, Barbara discovers that most of Edmund's face has been burnt off and he is reduced to wearing a flesh coloured mask. She is unable to control her revulsion and he flees. Though Upland Towers is passionless and severe and seemingly completely unconcerned at Barbara's complete inability to feel anything for him, she eventually agrees to marry him after fruitless years of waiting for Edmund's return, convince her that the young man is in fact dead. Miserable and alone, she fails to provide Upland Towers with a successor, and he in turn, much like Farmer Lodge with Gertrude after the withering, asked her what she was good for. When a life-size statue of Edmund arrives, commissioned while he was still an Adonis, travelling the continent, Barbara hides it in a specially constructed cupboard and suddenly begins to leave her husband's side each night, only to return after a prolonged period, utterly exhausted and decidedly flushed. The Earl's revenge when he discovers his wife's secret is horrifying. Having obtained a sketch of Edmund's ruined face, he commissions a workman to reproduce the disfigurement of the man upon the statue that had served once as a reminder of his former beauty. Oops. 
what the fire had maimed in the original, the chisel maimed in the copy. It was a fiendish disfigurement, ruthlessly carried out, and was rendered still more shocking by being tinted to the hues of life, as life had been after the wreck. When Barbara next visits the statue in the small hours, she screams and faints. Funny that. Upland Towers has the maimed statue brought to the foot of the marital bed and subjects Barbara to its terrible visage over three consecutive nights until she is literally horrified out of her longing, both romantic and sexual, for her former husband. Her sadistic new husband laughs brutally at this method of curing her. This entire passage was omitted from the version published in the graphic. Instead, dreading lest the scourge be applied anew, she promises to give her love to her current husband without a single further thought of the first. Having Barbara's revulsion at Widow Willow's disfigurement significantly lessened, a sizable part of her second husband's torturing of her omitted, and the removal of any references to Barbara's inability to give Lord, and Lord Upland Towers a lineal successor and his blaming her for it, all ensure that much of the ironic animus of the original tale is lost. But regarding the graphics slashing of Hardy's original manuscript, Upland Towers is made to appear much more humane with no mention of his wish for heirs or his demand to know Barbara's gynecological history. This morally improved Upland Towers does not laugh caustically at his psychological torturing of Barbara. In the graphic, she is only made to look at the mutilated statue once, not over a number of nights, which ultimately causes the schism that renders her an automaton. The new Lord Upland Towers was no doubt less offensive to graphic readers, but the story loses much of its gothic savagery. The appearance of statues within gothic tales is not as prevalent as one might expect. Only a handful of stories from the 19th century use this signifier, many preferring the automaton or the doll figure. Of the stories that do fe feature statues, Oscar Wilde's The Happy Prince is a parable of the rich and poor, while Henry James in The Last of the Valerii has an archaeologist in Rome fall in love with a statue of Juno to such a degree that his wife has the statue reburied. Indeed, in traditional mythology, a malevolent Venus Dionysus figure comes to life to claim a flesh and blood husband. This trope took a somewhat darker turn with the publication of Edith Nesbitt's short story, Man Size in Marble, in December 1887. It features a pair of statues, knights who had been men so wicked in life that upon their deaths, the great mansion that they had dwelt in was struck by lightning and burned to the ground. Each year on All Saints' Eve, the statues rise and try to return to their house. And a newly married couple who have moved into a cottage built on the site do not heed warnings to leave, resulting in the violent death of the young wife, whose corpse is found to be gripping in one hand a marble finger. While we cannot be sure that Hardy read this particular tale before writing Barbara of the House of Greed, it is certainly worth noting that his is possibly the only other story in which a male statue is the direct cause of a female character's unfortunate end. It is not only a gender reversal of Ovid's Pygmalion of Greek legend, where a male sculptor falls in love with the female statue he creates, but also a twist on the Jewish golem myth, in which a male creature is sculpted and brought to life to perform menial tasks, and can only be deactivated by the removal of the Shem on its forehead, which is a symbol of the names of God. 
at which point it crumbles to dust. The once beautiful Edmund is briefly brought back to life for Barbara in the form of his statue, but his task of fulfilling her romantic fantasies and desires ceases with the destruction of his pleasurableness. Disfigurement is a common feature of the Gothic grotesque. Oscar Wilde uses this trope to link the Gothic with the aesthetic in his portrayal of Dorian Gray in 1890, a character whose immorality is projected onto a painting secreted in his attic, enabling him to remain youthful and beautiful while the artwork festers in his stead. Dr. Jekyll's repressed immorality finds articulation in the grotesque Mr. Hyde in 1886, a mask for man's innate evil. However, Edmund Willows is neither immoral nor repressed. In him, Hardy represents an instance of virtuous masculinity, a prelapsarian Adam figure, an honest fellow and the son of an honest father, so it says. It is his nobleness of spirit and sense of duty to his fellow man that results in the disfigurement of his physical beauty, which in turn causes Barbara to recoil in horror. Like Gertrude Lodge before him, Edmund essentially dies twice, corporeally and then metaphorically, both characters being punished for another's Wildean obsession with aesthetic appearance. Where Gertrude was the unwitting victim of the male gaze, Edmund suffers under the female gaze. Upon meeting him, Barbara's mother herself openly admires his looks and invites him forward in no frigid tone. How handsome he is. I don't wonder at Barbara's craze for him. Barbara's secret adoration of Edmund's statue would seem to be the final phase in her love for him, mainly as a sexual object. Though Barbara is intrinsically naive, her objectification of Edmund is yet akin to that of the wealthy farmer lodgers Gertrude. The version of Barbara included in the volume publication emphasizes that Barbara loved Edmund's physical form over his virtuous character. Edmund is described as imperfectly educated and his blood of no distinction whatsoever. Hence his being sent to the continent with a tutor in order to make him a husband worthy of the grebe pedigree. The Gothic element in Barbara is featured in Lord Upland Tower's subjection of Barbara to the horrific statue while he jokes and laughs at her obvious distress, an action which is sadistic in the extreme. The mental torture she undergoes eventually causes a psychological schism, leaving her in a state of obsequious amativeness towards a perverse and cruel man. Ironically, even after slavishly giving birth 11 times in nine years, Barbara still fails to provide Upland Towers with an heir. The horror of relentless childbirth and infant death is lost in the Baudelaireized graphic serial version, but it is restored in its original hideousness for the volume collection. Only one child, a girl, survives childhood. Barbara dies, no surprise there, physically and mentally broken. But Upland Towers does not remarry, and upon his death, his title passes to a nephew. Like Lodge before him, Upland Towers' male line withers, just like Gertrude's arm. The cruelty perpetrated by both Lodge and Upland Towers upon their respective wives ensures that neither are provided with the desired male heir. The narrator concludes with an indictment of Barbara as a tender but somewhat shallow lady who fell in love with Edmund chiefly for his appearance. The more deplorable in that his beauty, by all tradition, was the least of his recommendations. Every 
report bearing out the inference that he must have been a man of steadfast nature, bright intelligence and promising life. Gertrude Lodge was also concerned with appearances, confusing lust, this time a husband's, for love. Six years of marriage and only a few months of love, if I could only again be as I was when he first saw me. For men think so much of personal appearance. In both these stories, Harty utilises the gothic tropes of disfigurement, sadism and the grotesque in what could, on the surface, appear as belonging to the female gothic mode of Anne Radcliffe portraying tyranny over the female, trapping her and leaving her unable to control access to her own space, but unable to escape from it either. Yet in Barbara, it is the male body that is objectified and brutalized, corporeally and metaphorically. In The Fiddler of the Reels, a woman is punished for her obsession with a demonic fiddle player. Her torment is both mental and physical. But where Gertrude and Barbara were punished by their husbands for their superficiality and supposedly failing in their maternal duties, Caroline Aspent pays for her union with the devil by forfeiting the daughter it produces. Hardy felt that a teller of tales must present the reader with something more unusual to relate than the ordinary experience of every average man and woman. And Mop Ollimore in The Fiddler of the Reels is an uncanny representation of masculine othering. In this story, Mop Ollimore personifies both the beautiful and the grotesque with his exquisite but infernal fiddle playing. Mop is a demonic fiddler who invades villages and possesses the bodies and souls of young girls through the power of music alone. Without uttering a single word of dialogue throughout the entire narrative, he manages to cause moral breakdown and widespread misery. Physically repellent to and disliked by men, he is nonetheless a diabolical siren-like figure fatally attractive to women. He is first othered by coming from nobody knew where, and then by his rather un-English, rich olive complexion. His hair is described as rank, dark, and rather clammy, to which he applies secret ointments, causing him to smell like the blossom boys love. Mop also at times wore curls, a double row, running almost horizontally around his head. But as these were sometimes noticeably absent, it was concluded that they were not altogether of nature's making. Two other characters within Hardy's oeuvre who memorably wear false hair extensions are Felice Charmond in The Woodlanders and Arabella Don in Jude the Obscure. Both of these women are anti-heroines or femmes fatale whose male admirers consequently suffer pain and even death. Identifying Mop with the figure of the femme fatale and then having him employ supernatural means of just seduction through his fiddle playing works to manifest him as being like Lucifer, the most beautiful of all angels who directed to the flow of music in heaven but who was cast out for daring to challenge the rule of God. Mop appears to be an extension of Hardy's earlier androgynous villains, Aeneas Manston from Desperate Remedies in 1871 and Will Dare from A Laodicean in 1881. While Manston is extremely handsome and his manner elegant, his face is rather too delicately beautiful, and his character shows a dangerous effeminacy. Like Mop after him, the effect of Manston's form of features upon womankind en masse is formidable. Like Mop, Will Dare also sports a feminine appearance, wearing his hair parted in the middle, 
hung as a fringe or valance above in the fashion sometimes affected by the other sex. Yet there is a swagger in his body and limbs, a latent power. Following on from Manston and Dare, Hardy has represented Mop's masculinity as being dangerous precisely for its feminine qualities. Mop Olimore's unheimlich beauty is rendered grotesque via his fantastical bowing of devil's tunes, a delineation linking him with the gothic aestheticism of Wilde's character Dorian Gray. Hardy's narrator compares Mop to Niccolo Paganini, the early 19th century Italian musician and composer who was known as the devil's violinist. He reportedly once proclaimed, I am not handsome, but when women hear me play, they come crawling to my feet. And just as it is said that audiences spontaneously burst into tears at the enchanting ferocity of Paganini's violin playing, so Mop Ollimore can make any child in the parish burst into tears in a few minutes. Like Will Dare before him, Mop is linked with Dionysus, though rather than his looks, it is with rites that use dance and music as intoxicants to remove inhibitive societal constraints. Mop can also be linked with Orpheus and Eros. He is a quasi-mythical figure whose physical and psychic potency is inseparable from his music. This again recalls Aeneas Manston, whose organ playing during an electrical storm so enthralls Cytheria that the music he plays enters into her with a gnawing thrill, causing her to shrink up beside him and look with parted lips at his face. Mop's bowing is fantastical and all were devil's tunes in his repertory. From the moment Carline Aspent first hears his insidious notes, she is compelled. Simply walking past him for the first time becomes an uncontrollable caper, reminiscent of St Vitus's dance or the tarantella performed by Nora in Ibsen's Adolf House. Such is Mop's malevolent enchantment of Carline that she will, without warning, start from her chair as if she had received a galvanic shock and spring convulsively towards the ceiling, then she would burst into tears. This is in response to simply hearing Mop's footsteps pass by the window. Mop is said to be able to play the fiddle so as to draw your soul out of your body like a spider's thread till you felt as limp as withy wind and yearned for something to cling to. Hardy's use of language such as fantastical, compelled and shocked are all reminiscent of the Gothic's protege, the sensation novel. Caroline's entrancements while Mop fiddles are to blows of torture, with Mop appearing as a fiddling figure against the wall. Caroline is seized into dancing and writhing until her feet ache convulsively dancing on, Mop's music projecting through her nervous, excruciating spasms. Even while the narrator of Fiddler tries to employ a scientific rationalism in explaining Carline's actions as certain automatic neurological responses, Hardy invests Mop with an aura of supernaturalism and raw sexual energy through his description of the unearthly and uncanny exuberance of Mop's fiddle playing. Hardy seems to suggest that even in a scientific age, the irrational and folkloric remains a persistent threat to social order. However, while it is Caroline Aspen's body in this story, which is tyrannized, it is poor Ned Hipcroft's spirit that is broken. Caroline's manly and simple wooer is in effect thwarted twice in his suit. After his initial rejection by Caroline in favor of Mop, 
Ned removes himself to London to find work as a labourer, but he also tends himself with the facility of a woman by cooking, cleaning and even darning his own stocking heels. Ned is sexually indifferent and seriously lacking in sexual energy, a perfect foil to Mop's raw sexual potency. Hardy has endowed both Ned and Mop with a masculinity that is somewhat feminine in its portrayal. Mop's feminine accoutrements are supplemented by his unheimlich qualities, making him irresistible to the female sex. Ned's soundness, placidity and womanly facilities ensure that he is the punished party for the transgressions of another, just as Gertrude Lodge before him is ultimately punished for the previous transgressions of her callow and superficial husband. Ned is not the victim of toxicity, however, but rather of female apathy and non-maternalism. He is quick to adopt a paternal role and grows to love Carline's daughter, the product of her unholy union with Mop, as his own. The daughter is referred to as Little Carrie, although Caroline as mother never directly addresses her in the entire narrative. Many of Hardy's stories, even more prevalently than the novels, undermine the notion that motherhood fulfills a woman's needs. This is one of the underlying themes of the story cycle, A Group of Noble Dames, featuring Barbara, but what Caroline's daughter is whisked, but when Caroline's daughter is whisked away by mob, Caroline literally loses no sleep over the abduction, while the child's adoptive father lies awake full of terrible imaginings. Ned's passionate proclamations after the little girl's disappearance further link him to the feminine. But she is mine all the same. Hunt a nuster, hunt a fed her and teach her, hunt a paid with her. Oh, little Carrie gone with that rogue gone. In stark contrast to this, Carline peevishly scolds Ned. Don't he raft yourself so, Ned, you prevent my getting a bit of rest. In candor in English fiction, Hardy noted that it will be conceded by most friends of literature that all fiction should not be shackled by conventions concerning budden womanhood, which may be altogether false. Caroline anticipates one who is perhaps Hardy's most reviled female character, Arabella Don. Jude Fawley's first wife in Jude the Obscure, where Arabella was likened to the Margaret Oliphant, I was going to give her a horrible word name, but I won't there, Margaret Oliphant to a human pig, Caroline has been described as an increasingly selfish and self-pitying girl in opposition to Ned, who bewails the loss of a child, not his own. Interestingly, it appears that over the many revised versions of The Fiddler, Mop and Caroline become distinctly more unpleasant in parallel with Ned becoming increasingly selfless and devoted to Little Carrie. In the serial version published in Scribner's magazine in New York, Mop is described as tolerable. But the first collection edition, Life's Little Ironies of 1894, and then in the Wessex edition of Hardy's Irvin 1912, Mott becomes repulsive. Correspondingly, a harsher and more critical portrait of Caroline progressively emerges, and Ned's instant rapport with Little Carrie is strengthened. Hardy's uses Hardy uses Mop's repulsiveness as Ned's maternal nurturing of a child not his own as an indictment of contemporary societal constraints on masculinity. Mop's incorporation of femininity problematizes readings of him as a Lothario, but it also serves to draw attention to Ned's problematic masculinity. While on the one hand, Ned's womanly traits indicate practicality and self-sufficiency, 
On the other, his feminine qualities lead him to be compromised when Mop abducts little Carrie at the end of the story. He is ultimately unable to protect his lover and his daughter by proxy from the demon fiddler. Hardy also portrays Caroline as a distinctly unmaternal woman whose physical responses to the devil's violinist belie the conventions expected of her. And by pointing out in candor in English fiction that literature should not be shackled by conventions concerning womanhood, Hardy is stressing that maternity and its associated functions and roles are social constructs, not factors inextricably linked with gender. In conclusion, everybody sighs relief. Gothic masculinity, as presented in these three stories, is one that at first suggests toxicity, but it is complicated by dichotomies of benevolence and malevolence and problematized by incorporation of the feminine. In The Withered Arm, Hardy presents two contrasting models of masculinity, the empathetic conjurer Trendle, who provides Gertrude Lodge and Rhoda Brook with an alternative route to knowledge and understanding via folkloric traditions. And the malevolent Farmer Lodge, whose self-obsession destroys the two women. In Barbara of the House of Grebe, it is a male rather than a female body that is objectified and brutalized corporeally and metaphorically. And where Caroline may be read as paying for her union with the devil and subsequent lack of maternal instinct by forfeiting the daughter it reproduces in The Fiddler of the Reels, it is actually Ned Hipcroft, the girl's father by proxy, who is published twice punished, I should say, twice, and each time by a diabolical mirror image of his femininely masculine self. Hardy appropriates certain aspects of the Gothic which foreground terror and psychological torment in these tales of a deformed limb, a mutilated statue and a satanic fiddle player and refuses to offer a rational explanation for the supernatural events that take place within each story. Taboos such as implied sexual relations with a statue or an otherworldly musician are transgressed through the appropriation of Gothic conventions such as imprisonment and torture. Hardy invokes the Gothic in order to subvert what is knowable and what is controllable. The short story is, as a form is the perfect vehicle for Hardy's tales that are more than exceptional to justify their telling. The end.